Good evening and welcome to Wednesday night Bible study, especially if you're visiting with us tonight. It's time for us to begin our Bible study, and if you would, uh, we'll start with a song, number 42, Faith is a Victory. After this hymn, we'll have a prayer, then we'll be a call to class. Number 42. Encamped along the hills of light, she Christian soldiers rise and press the battle where the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe and bears we know that all our truth be hurled. It is a victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory. Shouts of try and try by faith in life, the whirlwind breath swept on our every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still a shining shield. Faith is a victory. What raiment shall be given before the angels we shall know his name confessing man? Then onward from the hills of life, our hearts with love aflame, with anguish of the hosts of night, in Jesus' covering name. Faith pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege we have to come here tonight to study another portion of thy word. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with the teachers. Grant them a happy recollection of the things they prepared. Pray that we'll take what we hear and apply it to our everyday lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the many blessings that you so richly bless us with each and every day of our lives. And pray, Heavenly Father, we'll be ever mindful of these and use them to sow the seed in our hearts, minds, and hearts, and minds of others, if it be thy will. Pray, heaven, follow you, bless this nation at this time. Pray again that we will become a God-fearing, God-loving nation. And pray as members of the church we will lead the way and set the example. Go with us through this hour of study. Watch over and protect us, guide us, direct us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Bremen Church of Christ. On a rainy Wednesday evening, we're thankful for your coming out and being with us here for Bible study period. We do have visitors among us, and we're thankful for that, and invite you back anytime. Dismissed now with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. Middle and high school classes are dismissed as well.
couple of things to mention that uh, I'll mention these now so I don't run us up too late um, during the worship period but y'all just spread the word I guess when everybody else gets back up here but uh, just a reminder again of course it's been on the board and it's in the bulletin and it's in the announcements but just keep in mind the uh, seminar that's upcoming here on February 9th and 10th with brother Keith Mosier from the Memphis School of Preaching uh, there, there's there's more information that we've got on this on the handout. I was waiting on Brother Mosier to get back with me, so I had all the specifics right. But uh, he has, uh, of course, Brother Mosier's taught at at the preaching school there in Memphis almost as long as Moses was in the wilderness. Uh, he's he's been he's pushing 35 years. I heard that I heard that expression for the first time with uh, Eddie Brinkley. He was preaching somewhere, and he said that he's been in Wharton, Texas. That's where he's doing located work and. Uh, he said, I, I won't tell you how long I've been there, but I've been there longer than Moses was in the wilderness. <laughs> and then I talked to a guy last week, found out Brother Brinkley's been there in Texas for 50-something years now. So apparently what I was listening to was kind of dated. But Brother Moser's been teaching there at Memphis School of Preaching for uh, coming up on 35 years. Uh, he has uh, his doctorate in ministry, but with an emphasis on behaviorism. He's, he's very, uh, very well studied on behavioral type things and in fact I remember I don't know if he still does this or not but when I went to preaching school it was on the very first or maybe second day of class uh, he gave us this um, now I can't think of what it's called Myers-Briggs it's a personality assessment just to kind of uh, kind of a get to know us and see everybody's personality types and went over that with us so he's uh, he's done a lot of study and that kind of thing he also did an internship under uh, this fella his name is Daniel Wolfert and he is the the foremost expert in the country, or at least one of. He, for a long time, he was the expert. He, he, may, he may still hold that distinction, but he's one of the foremost experts in the country on thanatology, which is uh, a study of grief and grieving. And so I, I say all that to say that uh, Brother Moser's been doing these seminars since 2002. Uh, he said after doing that internship and some of the studies that he had done, he felt like maybe it was something that uh, people in the Lord's Church could benefit from. He said he, he noticed that there was very few uh, materials out there on that subject. Uh, he, he just couldn't find a whole lot. Now, there are, there are these brothers, they're, they're fleshly brothers, they're also spiritual brothers. Uh, in, um, where are they, Miss Jamie? Florence? Florence, right? Florence area of Alabama. Don and Ron Williams. And they also uh, do this kind of thing, and they're very good at that. And I met them one year at Polishing the Pulpit. When I was still at GBN, I went up there and did some interviews for the network and um, had a chance to meet them and talk to them a little bit about their work. But Brother Moser's done these seminars since 2002, and in that time he's done, a, a, he said, over 30 of these seminars. And so they are really, really top-notch. Uh, you know, sometimes the tendency may be to think, well, uh, I'm not... I'm not necessarily grieving right now, but, you know, the, the idea is, in fact, we put this on the flyer, uh, whether you may be hurting yourself, maybe you know somebody who is hurting, maybe you want to be able to help someone who is hurting. I think every single one of us knows somebody who is hurting, and, and one of the things that we want to do for anybody, but especially those that we care about, is to help them uh, when they're hurting, and that's kind of the theme of the seminar, help for those who are hurting. So keep that in mind. It, it, uh, I just can't say enough good about it. Like I said, I've not been able to attend one in person, so I just can't wait uh, to get to experience it from that standpoint. But I heard the one that he did at Forest Hill on CD, and I was just really, really impressed. And uh, In fact, I heard it, it's been at least a couple of years ago. We were, I think we were just moved to Childersburg when I got a copy of that and listened to it. And I thought to myself then, this is something that uh, I wish every congregation, every member of the church could hear because he, he deals with the subject, but he also deals with it from a Christian biblical perspective. He's approaching it from a, a standpoint of non-denominational Christianity, just, just looking at the Bible, but also looking at what experts in that field have discovered. And so it's, uh, it's really top-notch. So I wanted to give a big plug for that in the beginning. And then also it's in our announcements, but uh, just, just some more details. Uh, Jim Merle has been mentioned. Jim is one of the preachers at the Ironiton Church where Cliff Goodwin is and Chris Clevenger are there working. Uh, Jim was in full-time ministry up until just a few years ago when his heart got so bad that he had to move back home to get closer to family and get better care, uh, not better medical care necessarily, just being closer to family so they could help out. Jim's wife, Jennifer, also has some chronic health problems, 
So she's many times not really in good shape to help him. So they're, they're dealing with a lot of things right now. Jim's had a, a he, it's a congenital heart condition. Uh, he was born with this. The doctors told his mother when he was born, or at least in his very early youth, they said he'll never live to be 18. And he, he's kind of defied the odds from that moment on. And so it got so bad a few years ago, they said, you're just going to have to have a new heart. And that's the only thing that's going to do it. Then he got better for a little while. And the doctor said, well, we're taking you off the transplant list because you're too healthy to be on there. And so that was kind of good news, but, but not great news because they knew ultimately it was coming to that. But the last few months, uh, Jim has really gone downhill. He's now home from the hospital. He was in the ICU at UAB because he had an infection. Uh, they, they took out his pick line so that they could get rid of that infection, and that's, that's out now. But he's at home, and his wife said he sleeps about 90% of the time. I mean, he's... Uh, literally somewhere around 18 hours a day, he's sleeping. Uh, that's just how low his, his heart is functioning right now. Uh, Jim and, and Jennifer have two small children. and uh, In fact, the, the daughter, Juliana, is really struggling with this. And so they, I know they would really appreciate uh, our prayers. So I, I wanted to mention Jim especially as well. And, uh, Jim was doing a great work in Mississippi in local work. And he had to give that up just because his health wouldn't allow it. Uh, like I said, he came to Ironis, and they both, him and his wife, both grew up in the Talladega Munford area. Uh, he's done great things for the Ironiton Church. Most anything you see on the web that is Ironiton affiliated, it's been done by Jim. I mean, he really is knowledgeable in that kind of thing, and he's done a great, uh, great deal of work with that, and still tries to do as much as he can. He's just not able to do very much at all these days. But uh, he's another one that really needs our prayers. Okay, let's, uh, let's get into our Old Testament history where we left off. This is where we left off last week. We talked about David and got up through the end of David's reign. Um, any, any questions or anything? I know we went right up to time last time. I'm, I'm bad to do that. Sometimes we run out of time at the end of class, so there may be questions or comments or observations, anything. But we got to Solomon's reign. David reaches the end of his life. Of course, his reign was about how many years? About 40 years. So you get to the end of David's life. There's a small interim there because um, David, David kind of anoints or, or names Solomon as his heir. Of course, David had other sons, and one of his sons tried to take over the throne. And uh, I think we may have mentioned this either last week or the week before that Bathsheba actually comes to David and says... Uh, didn't you say Solomon was going to reign after you? And he said, yes. And she said, well, you need to know he's trying to take over the throne. And so David actually comes and specifically names Solomon as the king. And then Solomon's going to reign 40 years as well. 1 Kings 1 through 11. Now, in 1 Kings 3, of course, this is what Solomon many times we remember him for. God comes to him and says, basically, what is, what is it that God says to him? Yeah, he says, basically, ask me whatever you want to ask. Uh, you can ask for anything. And so I've, I've, I've taught, in fact, we studied this in a vacation Bible school not too, uh, not too terribly long ago. And I asked the kids in, in opening up this lesson, you know, if you could ask, if God were to come to you and say you could ask for anything, what would it be? And, of course, you got some of the typical answers that, you know, sometimes young folks would, would ask for. Some of them said money. Some of them said uh, that girlfriend or that girl that they've been wanting to be their girlfriend or that boy that they've been wanting to be their boyfriend, you know, all kind of different answers. Some of them said, I want to be famous. Uh, God says this to Solomon, though, and he says, Lord, I'm just, I'm one person. I'm just little old me. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom to rule over this people as you would have me to do. And so God says, because you said that, in fact, get it, let's go to First, First Kings chapter 3. And about verse 6 is Solomon's reply. Of course, verse 5, at the end of that verse, God says, Ask what I shall give thee. Really, let's just drop down to verse 7 where he says, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered, 
nor counted for multitude. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Of course, the speech pleased the Lord, verse 10. And God says, Because thou hast asked this thing, and it's not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches. And by the way, that's usually a, a, one of the things I got from the young folks, too. They would say, I'd ask to live uh, a long time or live forever, sometimes they say. Uh, Nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. Now, sometimes we stop there, but read on to verse 14. And if, and that's conditional, thou wilt walk in my, my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So God says, I'm going to give you more than what you asked for because you chose wisely. I'm going to give you the wisdom that the world's never seen like it in a human, nor will it ever see it since in a human. Now, Jesus, of course, possessed that wisdom and, and more. Jesus, of course, being human, but also being God in the flesh. But as far as just humanly speaking, never been anyone like him, nor will there ever be anyone like him as far as wisdom goes. But he says, I'm also going to give you riches, honor, and if you'll serve me, then I'll give you length of years. Now, the, the problem is, of course, what happened with Solomon? Yeah, he, he had his heart turned away from the Lord. So God, he asked, God was pleased with his request, but, uh, but he didn't follow through completely. Oh, well, let's mention this first before we get into all that. Uh, Solomon oversaw the building of the temple. That was completed somewhere around 960 B.C. You see that in 1 Kings chapter 6, uh, verses 1 and then 38. the completion there. Solomon built his own house, uh, a great palace for himself. And then he also built, of course, remember, David had everything prepared for the building of the temple. He just didn't do it. Does anybody remember the reason why David didn't build the temple? I mean, other than the fact that God said not to. Why did God, what reason did God give him? Yeah, he said, you, you were a man of war, too much bloodshed under your reign. And so Solomon's reign is a reign of peace. So, in fact, chapter 7, verse 1, Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he finished all his house. So 13 years to build this amazing palace that he built. Sometimes people will use the expression that Israel was at its zenith under Solomon. In other words, it was at its height of wealth, of power, of fame, and so on and so forth under the reign of Solomon. Solomon's reign was one of peace. David had pretty well subdued all the enemies. Uh, they were at their greatest... Um, as far as the borders, the extension of the borders was at its greatest under the reign of Solomon. The wealth, uh, the, the wealth under Solomon's reign was just amazing. And then, of course, you have the wisdom of Solomon. I think this, whoops, that's what I just mentioned. There we go. Uh, when Solomon started out as king, he loved God. Um, 1 Kings 3, 3, we see that because he asked for wisdom and he wants to serve God. He wants to do what God would have him to do. But... His downfall came through his marriages with, you know, of course, he's famous for what? How many wives and how many concubines? 307. 300 and 700. I was about to ask somebody to help me out there because I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting. I may have it on my notes here. I, would, I just went blank. Anyway, I think it's 300 wives and 700 concubines. But uh, he had a whole bunch of wives. And these wives were not of the children of Israel. And so, as you can imagine, they start turning his heart away from God to idols. So Solomon began serving these idols. Now, some folks believe, and I'm one of them, that the book of Ecclesiastes is sort of a public statement of repentance. Now, we know it's inspired of God. He's writing it by inspiration. But it seems to be that by the end of his life, Solomon realizes this is not where it's at. This, this thing of being so involved with women and getting, getting your heart turned away from God by women and, and money and fame, those, those things are not, in fact, you know, the end of the book, the verse that we so often quote, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. 
I, I used to tell sometimes if I spoke to teenagers uh, a few years ago, the, the popular expression was among the young folks, been there, done that. And sometimes they'd say, bought the T-shirt. <laughs> so I'd say to, to the young folks sometimes, Solomon is basically saying here at the end of the book, hey, I've been there and I've done that. And here's what is really important in life. Fear God, keep his commandments. Uh, you see throughout the book of Proverbs, Solomon is, is writing much of that book. And he's often saying to his son, if, if we wanted to paraphrase it into modern terms, it's like he's saying, son, I've made some terrible mistakes in my life. And I'm trying to keep you from doing the same. It's hard sometimes for us as young folks. And, and, and I've, I've been there as a young person. And every one of us here that's beyond teenage or young adult years has been there. It's hard sometimes to appreciate and understand that our parents are trying to keep us from making some of the same mistakes that they made. But that's exactly what Solomon is saying to his son in much of the book of Proverbs. Son, I've made some bad mistakes. I did some really stupid things in my youth. So listen to me and I can help keep you from some of those mistakes that I made. Fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole of man. But Solomon messed up uh, earlier in his life. And, and hopefully, uh, if, if I'm right and others who have uh, supposed that that book is kind of a letter of repentance, then th that's the good news is that he, he straightened himself out before leaving this life. But Solomon made some big time mistakes. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, and he, he says, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. Uh, you know, and he says, that's, that's a very good paraphrase of it. What he's saying there toward the end of the book is to all young folks everywhere, you do what you want because we are created with free will. He's not, it's not licensed just to do whatever you want, but it's kind of like, uh, I've used the expression here before, I believe, that you know, when a parent tells a child, well, you just do what you want. And then you know, we understand as children, that's not, that's not permission. That's saying... I understand that you have free will and you're going to do what you want, but you will suffer the consequences if you do. And that's what, that's what Solomon says, you know. You're, at the end of the day, we're all going to do what we want. And that's why God stresses so much over and over again in the Old Testament. It's not a New Testament concept, just a New Testament concept. It's, it's throughout the Bible. God emphasizes repentance. And repentance is changing our heart, our mind, to follow God. Because if my mind is set on following God then what do I want to do? Follow God. I want to do what he wants me to do. And so it's not, you know, it's kind of like here's a, here's a young man and he takes interest in a, a young lady and man, they're getting serious and the, his friends say, oh, you've got to go off and be with your girl this weekend, huh? We're not, we're not hanging out because you're going off. You've got to go do that. And, you know, he's saying, I don't got to do anything. I want to go be with her. You know, it's, it's what we want to do. And so people are going to do what they want. And so if our heart is right with God, then we want to do what he would have us to do. But if our heart's not right, you know, Solomon says, and of course God through Solomon is saying, you're going to do what you want to do, but understand there's a judgment day coming. As we sing in the song, there's a great day coming, and we're going to have to answer for it. Solomon, even though, as I said, if, if I'm right about Ecclesiastes, he made some things right, but there were some consequences uh, what's the main consequence of, of Solomon's huge mistakes that he made with his many wives? What'd you say? Yeah. What, what happened? What's our next period of Old Testament history that we're going to get into tonight? The divided kingdom. That was the major consequence of his actions. God says, Solomon, you didn't follow me. It's almost as if God says... Uh, in, in modern day language to Solomon, I made a covenant with you that if you would keep my will, all these things would happen. I gave you, I promised him. Now, he didn't put a condition on the, on the fame and the fortune. He gave Solomon those like he promised. But he says, I, I told you if you would follow me, I'd lengthen your days and your kingdom would be established and strong. But he says, you didn't do that. So the kingdom's going to be torn and, and divided. And that's our next period of Old Testament history. And it's amazing as you go through Old Testament history as we've been doing in this study that how many times we notice periods of Old Testament history that really should never even be there because you know you have one period that we mentioned wilderness wanderings 
Well, it should have gone from um, bondage and exodus into conquest and possession. But you've got the unfaithful spies. They, they go and they spy out the land. Ten of them are unfaithful. And then you've got Joshua and Caleb who try to talk some sense into the people. God says, uh, the congregation, of course, listened to the unfaithful spies. And God says, well, since you think you're going to die in the wilderness and you're not, you don't believe that you're going to enter into my promised land, then you're not going to enter. And so now you have that period of the wilderness wanderings. Well, because of Solomon's mistakes, uh, the consequences of that were that the kingdom was divided. And, of course, we learn from that that sometimes, even though there's forgiveness, and we also saw this with David and his sin with Bathsheba, there's forgiveness from God, and God stands ready, willing, and able to forgive us when we make mistakes, but sometimes there are consequences that go along with actions. And we can be forgiven of the spiritual uh, consequences of them, but that doesn't take away the earthly consequences. And that's what happens with Solomon. Um, oh, what's, uh, what's one of the examples? Somebody give us an example, if you remember one, of, of Solomon's wisdom. One, one event always comes to my mind when I think about Solomon's wisdom. Of course, the Queen of Sheba came on one occasion, even asking him hard questions and wanted to prove it prove his wisdom and see if, in other words, test is the idea there. The King James word version uses prove, but it's the idea of testing. She wants to see if he's really as smart and as wise as everybody says he is. And she said what? What was her statement? She said, the half has not yet been told. Uh, she said, it's just as, he's just as wise as I heard and then some. But then there was also a particular event. Yeah, there's these two women arguing over a baby. The baby was uh, smothered. And so one of them saying, oh, it's my baby. The other one said, oh, no, that's, that's my baby. Well, how, how are you going to deal with that? I mean, it, many of us know, already know what happened in that story, but if, if you can imagine that not having any idea of what Solomon decided to do, how on earth would you answer that? Two women here, they're both saying, this is my baby, she's lying. No, she's lying, it was my baby. How do you deal with that? What was Solomon's... <laughs> yeah, they didn't have DNA samples back then, of course. So what does Solomon say to do? He says, bring me a sword. I'll tell you what we'll do. You ladies can't quit fussing over this. We'll just cut the baby in half, and we'll give half to one and half to the other. Now, did he ever intend to do that? Well, certainly not. Well, so why did he say do that then? The one who was the true mother of the baby said, no, 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 just give it to her. Well, she don't want her baby hurt. So he knows then. He says, well, here's, your, here's the, the baby's real mother. So you see the wisdom there. You know, that Sometimes you just see things like that, and you think, boy, I'd have never thought of that. Uh, just the wisdom that he possessed and he put into use. And, of course, we see people that have a lot of wisdom in our day and age, but even, even the wisest, obviously, don't, they don't come near to what Solomon had. I've often mentioned before, uh, one of the things that has amazed me when I study the life of Brother Keeble is just the wisdom that that man has to deal with situations and to think on his feet. Uh, but boy, you see it here with Solomon, with that situation with those ladies, and, and it was just over and over again in his life, his wisdom was displayed. Uh, that's one reason why the kingdom did so well. They were so rich. They were so uh, they were expanding the borders so. But Solomon's great mistake, of course, was through his wives. There we go. Got a delayed reaction from this remote here. Uh, here's our memory verse from this section, 2 John 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Anything else about Solomon, by the way, before we move on? I know we're hitting that pretty quick, but I wanted to go ahead and get into period number 9 tonight. Anything else? I feel like I may be forgetting something here I wanted to, that I wanted to mention. But Solomon, of course, remembered mainly for his wisdom and, and remembered for his, his mistakes uh, with marrying the wives and allowing them to turn his heart away from the Lord. And, and that gets back again to what God said over and over again when the law of Moses was given. Stay away from the strange women. Now, he's not talking about women that were just weird. Strange meaning foreign. They were not Israelites. They were not worshiping the true God. That's another sermon I heard Brother Brinkley preach about strange things God hates. Uh, and one of the things that God hated uh, is, and still uh, we have to be careful about today is marrying those who would turn our heart away from the Lord. Strange doctrine, strange, um, strange fire in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. We talked about that and we were in that section. So 
Solomon's big mistake, though, was right there. I wonder if I got a low battery on this thing or something. <laughs> I hit. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, let's, let's review the eighth period of Old Testament history if there's nothing else on Solomon. What's the eighth period called? United Kingdom. Oh, there we go. And it goes from what to what? The anointing of Saul as the first earthly king to the death of Solomon. How long did the eighth period of Old Testament history last? 120 years, approximately. Um, which king loved the Lord at the beginning of his reign, but later had foreign wives turn his heart away from God? Solomon. We just covered that. Uh, first three kings of Israel, in order. Saul, David, and Solomon. Who anointed the first two kings of Israel? Samuel, prophet, who was also a judge, who was also a priest. <laughs> there it goes. Why did the first king of Israel want to kill the man who later became second king? Jealous. Wow. There we go. Um, the territory of Israel was largest under the reign of which king? Solomon, we just covered that. Uh, which king's problems began when he committed adultery with another man's wife? David, and what was the woman's name? Bathsheba. Second John 9, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And again, these memory verses are not necessarily related to the periods of history. These are just some good memory verses to work on. And by the way, these are at the bottom of each sheet. I know sometimes you may not just get these in the one or two times we repeat them in class. But they're at the bottom of each worksheet. All right, just by way of review, let's go. Let's name our periods of Old Testament history. What's period number one? Antediluvian or before the flood, either one. And it goes from what to what? Creation to, to the flood. And then you got post-diluvian. I was supposed to ask that, but there you go. <laughs> Which is what? The flood to... Now we're getting way back. Call of Abraham. And then what's the next period? I got a quick trigger finger now. I got to watch myself. Patriarchal. I heard somebody say it. And that goes from, obviously, from the call of Abraham to death of Joseph. I keep doing it. There you go. Bondage and Exodus is number four. I'm supposed to be asking these. I got to put that thing down. Bondage and Exodus is period number four. So that goes from the death of Joseph to what? Crossing the Red Sea. That marks the Exodus. And then period number five is what? Wilderness wanderings, that's one we just mentioned that really should not have even been there. And it goes from the crossing of the Red Sea to crossing the Jordan River. And then period number six, conquest and possession from the crossing of the Jordan to death of Joshua. Whoop, I got to, I'm doing it even with it up there. What's period number seven? Judges. And that's from the death of Joshua to anointing of Saul as the first earthly king and then period number eight United Kingdom this is getting us up close to where we left off uh, from the anointing of Saul to death of Solomon and that brings us to what we're about to cover divided kingdom which is the death of Solomon to follow the northern kingdom follow the northern kingdom to whom Assyria uh, not, not to be confused with Syria, S-Y-R-I-A. This is Assyria, A-S-S-Y-R-I-A. And that was somewhere 721, 722 B.C. But the, when the northern kingdom falls, that ends the divided kingdom. And then that brings, brings us into the next period, which is Judah alone. So that's from the fall of the northern kingdom to, obviously, fall of the southern kingdom. The fall of the southern kingdom to whom? Babylon. It... I'm telling you, I just can't stop hitting that button. I, I told you I got an itchy trigger finger tonight. Exile and captivity is number 11. The, the southern kingdom fell. What I was trying to say when I got too quick on the draw there. And, uh, the southern 
Cana fell to Babylon, and I'm, I'm trying to get those dates right, there were, there were three carryings away into captivity. Let's see, it would be 606, 596, and 586. Somewhere, and give or take a few years on each one of those dates. But that, that marks the end of the period of Judah alone, and that brings you to exile. They're in exile in Babylon, and that goes from all the southern kingdom to what? To the decree of Cyrus that allowed the Jews to return home. Somebody say it quick before I hit the button. What's number 12? Restoration. Maybe I, can, maybe I can hold this thing again now. The restoration goes from the decree of Cyrus to, to the end of somebody's work. Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes to restore the walls. Of course, you have, you have three carryings away into captivity when Judah falls. You also have three returns from captivity. You have Zerubbabel, who comes to restore the temple. And then you have Ezra, who comes to restore the law. And then you have Nehemiah, who comes to restore the walls. So there are your periods of Old Testament history, just by way of review. And let me go ahead and pull this up, period number nine. Let's look at period number nine. Now, this handout you should already have because we handed those out last week. So you'd be ready for this. So again, this is the death of Solomon to the destruction of the northern kingdom by Assyria. Where do we read about it in the Bible? Several places in 1 Kings 12 to 22, 2 Kings 1 to 17, also 2 Chronicles 10 to 28. There are a few important places you want to remember in this section. Jerusalem obviously is important. What else? Without, see if you can answer without looking at your sheet. I, I saw heads go down, so it may be too late. <laughs> Dan and Bethel, we'll talk about those uh, in just a moment. Well, Samaria is the other one, capital of the northern kingdom. Um, when the northern kingdom is established, Samaria ends up being established as the capital of that kingdom. And then you have Dan and Bethel, where the golden calves are set up. And we'll, like, as I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Um, Bethel, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and mention that. It's interesting, Bethel is, goes back to, in fact, I was just reading this morning in my daily reading that uh, in Genesis 17, if I remember that correctly, where Jacob has his dream of the stairway to heaven or the ladder as the King James puts it. If you, if you have a modern version or if you're a Led Zeppelin fan, I guess it's stairway to heaven. Let me ch check my references there. No, that's not right at all. I'm thinking 27. Anyway. Oh, well, it's in Genesis. You'll, you'll, you'll come to it if you, if you read there. It's somewhere in the 20s. 27 is where uh, Jacob and Rebekah deceive Isaac, so it's not there. But anyway, it's uh, Jacob lies down. Of course, he, a pillow is his stone, and he has this dream of, of this stairway, and the angels are descending and ascending on the stairway. But he calls the, the name of the place Bethel, 28. Thank you. It's driving me crazy. 28 verse 12 and he calls the name of the place Bethel and that literally is translated to the house of God uh, many almost always when you see L E L on the end of a word like that it, it, it's something having God in the name uh, in fact in, in Genesis 1 when God says let us make man in our image sometimes people talk about the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the Trinity come, comes from the council of whatever and that's usually a reference to uh, some kind of Roman Catholic council. Uh, but the doctrine of the Trinity didn't come from any council. It's kind of like saying the Bible came from some council. It didn't come from a council. It came from God. And the doctrine of the Trinity came from God. Uh, it goes back to Genesis 1 where God says, Let us make man in our image. That's Elohim, which is plural in the Hebrew. It's, it's more than one. It's, it, there's one God, and then there are three distinct beings in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Of course, 
getting back to the Old Testament times, it's the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit. When He uh, it comes in the flesh, He becomes known as the Son. But Bethel means house of God. And when you get into the book of, I believe it's Hosea, where it's mentioned several times. I may be confusing it with Amos, actually. Uh, it's Hosea or Amos 1, but in the, one of the minor prophets, one of those two books, oftentimes he'll refer to Beth-Avon. What he's talking about is Bethel. Bethel means house of God. Beth-Avon means house of vanity. It's an interesting change there that God, by inspiration, is giving the prophet to make on that word. It's kind of a play on words. Here's the house of God. You've set up your idolatrous calf worship there, and it's become the house of vanity because of this idolatrous practice that's going on there. Let's talk about important people in this section. 19 kings of the northern kingdom, not a one of them was righteous. Not a single one. They all, 19, were wicked. You've also got the first 12 kings of Judah covered in this period. It goes through Hezekiah. In fact, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is covered in Isaiah and also in 2 Kings, and it's where Jerusalem is besieged by Sennacherib, king of Assyria. The Assyrian king has conquered the north. He's taken them off into captivity. He's about to conquer Jerusalem. But Hezekiah... He doesn't go and say, let's send money to Egypt and ask them if we can buy their help. Now, this was very popular in those days. You would go, you'd send a lot of gold. In fact, one of the kings of Judah, if we have time, we may talk about that on our time, but one of the kings of Judah actually stripped gold from the temple of God. And, and you know, you talk about the irony of taking gold from the house of God, the Almighty, you're stripping down gold off of the temple, sending it to Egypt to pay for military help. Come over here and help us fight our battles. Not looking to heaven and saying, God, please help us fight our battles because only you can save us. But saying, we're going to take money even from the very house of God and send it over here to try to buy help. That was very popular in those days. They'd send off for military help um, or, or offer some other kind of service. But Hezekiah doesn't do that. Hezekiah understands that only God can help us. And so he asked God for help. Uh, the prophet Isaiah brings word to Hezekiah that God has heard his prayer and God has answered his prayer. In fact, when Brother Moser is here, he's going to talk. Uh, there's an occasion in the, in the uh, life of Hezekiah right after his, uh, his deliverance from Sennacherib where Hezekiah becomes very sick and you're going to see uh, Brother Moser talks about it and it's, it's a term that they use in that field of thanatology, personal grief. And our Sunday morning worship period on February the 10th, that's going to be the topic. Hezekiah as an illustration of personal grief. But, but this section covers through Hezekiah. Uh, Hez it actually kind of stops still in his life uh, because he's not dead when, this, when the northern kingdom goes into captivity. But Judah did not fall to Sennacherib. What happened, by the way, in that story? Why didn't they fall? I mean, we know God helped them, but how specifically? God sends, I heard it, somebody over here. 186,000. Um, but yeah, God sends an angel answering Hezekiah's request for help. And Hezekiah even receives this letter. It's one of the most blasphemous sections of Scripture where you see what Rabshakeh, who was basically Sennacherib's general, what he says. You know, he says, oh, none of the gods of these other cities were able to stop me, Hezekiah. Your God's not going to help you, so why don't you just give it up? Hezekiah even he get, receives a letter from Rabshakeh, and he actually takes it and spreads it before the Lord and says, see what he's saying about our, you and your people, Lord, help us, please. And God says, I'm going to help. He said, in fact, God even says, he's not going to set foot in my city. Go ahead and plant your crops because you're going to be around to reap them. He's going right back by the way that he came. And an angel of the Lord went out that night and killed 186,000 people, and they returned back, and Sennacherib was killed by his own sons, as he worshipped his idol god in that temple, in that idolatrous temple. Uh, prophets, the prophets uh, Elijah and Elisha are also important in this section. We'll talk more about them as we get to that, uh, assuming we have time for that. Did he just ring a bell? Man. All right. I think, I 
think. Come on. There we go. Um, here's just a little chart for you of these kings. The, the parentheses is how many years each one reigned. Uh, just to give you an idea here, this, these two columns are all Israel's kings. Uh, over here, you have Judah's kings. Um, I think I got one cut off there. Somebody count that for me. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Yeah, I got one of them cut off there. But anyway... Um, those are the kings, and you see, sometimes you got Zimri here, he reigns for seven days. Zechariah for six months, Shalom for one month, and then you got some guys like Baasha reigning for 24 years, Jeroboam the second reigning for 41 years. Um, and it, sometimes it's hard to keep up, too, because they're, sometimes they're concurrent, like Jeroboam's reigning when Rehoboam reigns. But see, Rehoboam dies and Abijam takes over, but Jeroboam is still reigning. In fact, he's still reigning when Asa takes over. So... Some of these go concurrent. Sometimes you'll have multiple kings during one kingdom. You know, you have to just... Some of that gets confusing as you go through it all. But uh, I saw one time, if I can find that, I may see if I can get a copy. It'd probably be too... It'd probably be unreadable to put it up here. It'd be so small. But I saw a timeline, I think, one time that was very helpful looking at the kings and who was concurrent with whom. But anyways, main thing I want us to remember from this is that all these guys were, were wicked. All of your northern kings were wicked. All, not all of the southern kingdom, but not all of them were righteous, but not all of them were wicked either. So there were some who were, uh, who were good kings. Some of them were good for a time and then fell away. Uh, Uzziah is one. We don't really know what did Uzziah ever repent. The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, the Bible does tell us that he started off right, but he, it, it says his heart was lifted up to his destruction. So sometimes they started off right, and then they, for whatever reason, maybe they got lifted up with pride like Uzziah, or maybe they, you know, for whatever reason, fell away. Some of them have multiple names. Uh, you'll see here, Azariah, he's sometimes referred to, sometimes Uzziah. Jehoiakim, Jeconiah, Coniah, that's all the same person. I was in a discussion one time with a guy on email when I was at GBN, and he said, he said I reckon Jehoiakim would have answered to Bubba if you'd have called him. He had about three different names. So, but that's just kind of a, a quick glance at them there. I had one more thing I wanted to cover, and I don't know if I've got time. Somebody's, I can't see what, it looks like we're about a minute away. Is that right? I better not get into that. We'll look at that next time. I'm going I'm to talk about Jeroboam. And, uh, Jeroboam was one of the, he, he by no means was the first, but he was one of the, one of the early infamous change agents as far as the worship of God is concerned. We still deal with those to this day, his descendants, spiritually, who want to change God-prescribed worship. And you see how serious a matter that is when you start looking at the life of uh, Jeroboam. But I, I want to make some specific notes, some specific things about what he changed and how he changed it and uh, things of that nature, but I, I don't want to get into that because I, I know I'm going to run out of time. Uh, anything... In particular, coming to mind thus far? I'm probably not going to want to get into my next thing on the slides either. Uh, I will say this before we move on. This period will last for a period of about 210 years. Uh, we noticed the United Kingdom lasts about 120 years. This divided kingdom period is going to be about 210. So you've got various kings reigning at various times. Uh, of course, here, here's another infamous king from this period, Ahab. My kids always refer to him as mean old king Ahab. Uh, and his infamous wife, who was Jezebel. Uh, she perhaps was more wicked, more infamous than he was. Anything else before we dismiss? Boy, the time flew by today. Um, we'll, what we'll do next week, Lord willing, I want to talk about Jeroboam to start off, and then we'll start looking at some of the specific events from this divided kingdom period. If nothing else, we'll, take, we'll be dismissed. I was going to say take a break, but I'm thinking Sunday morning. We'll just be dismissed until Brother Chris gets up to do our announcements. Are you doing the announcements? Jake, okay. Thank you all very much.
have your announcements, uh, sorry, your attention rather for some announcements this evening. have quite a few before Brother Chad offers the invitation. Please remember Sister Frida Gray who has the shingles, not doing well. Also Hubert and Florine King who have the flu, but they are getting some better. Also please remember Ken Glover who will have knee surgery tomorrow in Rome. And remember Jesse Bracknell who will have neck surgery very soon. Please continue to remember Brother Sidney as he recovers at home. Also, Karen Lloyd and James Woody, this is Greg's dad. He has been moved to Carrollton Manor Nursing and Rehab Center. Please remember Hooper and Mary Sue Mara. Jim Morrell, who's the Associate Minister at Aronaton. He is now home but in dire need of a heart transplant. Please remember all these folks and others that are on our bulletin, in the bulletin on the prayer list. Express our sympathy to the family of Emma Winchester, who passed away this morning. She was the wife of Jonathan Winchester, who's the youth minister at Graymere Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. They have two very young children. Please remember them in your prayers. Also, we received a thank you note from the Lou Overby family. The Lou Overby and family, this will be posted on the bulletin board. We have a work day here at the building this Saturday at 8 o'clock. There will be a meeting this Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock for education supervisors. There will be a youth service food and fun day January 21st, 10 o'clock here at the building. Lunch is provided. Please wear work clothes and kids need to be picked up at 4 p.m. Brothers Keepers Group 2, Blake and Honey's Group, and Group 3, Mark and Deborah's Group will meet in the fellowship hall after evening worship on January the 20th. Please sign the list in the foyer for breakfast foods. Gary and Jamie's group, group one, is planning a progressive dinner that will begin 4 p.m. Saturday the 26th. Please sign up in the foyer if you plan to participate and give $5 to Gary for the cost of food. The, the van will be available for transportation for the progressive dinner. The West Georgia Youth Rally is this weekend. There's a Bonfire Devo 
and pizza night this Friday will be 6.30 to 8.30. Chad will speak on Saturday at 10. The van will leave here at 6 o'clock on Friday night and 9.30 Saturday morning. They also have a gospel meeting coming up at West Georgia, Wednesday the 23rd through Sunday the 27th. Jay Alexander is speaking. The Bowden Winter Lectureship will be February 1st through 3rd. Keith Mosher will be here at Bremen February 9th and 10th. He'll be speaking on help for those who are hurting. It'll be 9 to 12 on Saturday and at the regular and 1 to 2 on Saturday as well, and regular service times on Sunday. There's a marriage retreat coming up, Pigeon Forge, 15th and 16th of February. See Chad for more information. Our first area-wide singing of the year will be February 22nd here at Bremen.